then I will start. Go for it. Do you want to start? No, you can start. Okay. Feel free. Okay. So, um, welcome to this panel discussion on um, art and art practices in the context of the festival theme, which this year is lost. With us in our panel discussion today, we have Daniel Carrico, Ritty Mystery, Ethan Selby, uh, Dr. Jen E. Boyle, Joshua White, and Armin Means joining us, um, myself and Simon from Lacuna Festivals hosting. Um, the way the event's going to run is we're going to have an introduction from each of our panel members, and then we'll follow that with um, a kind of looser discussion around the topic. So I'm going to hand over first to the person who suggested this topic. Thank you for doing that. And um, that is Daniel. Thank you. Um, I'm really honored to be part of this. And I think we're going to have some pretty interesting discussions here. So let me um, start with presenting a little bit on my uh, work as a background of, of how to think about this, this subject. Let's say the entire screen. Okay. It's happening. <laughs> um, all right. Can you guys see this? Yeah. Really well. We're muted. Mm. Okay. So, um, in starting to think about this, basically, I am. Uh, um, kind of looking at where I come from originally. So uh, I was born in uh, a what's now Serbia and used to be a, a country of Yugoslavia. And that has kind of driven my entire uh, career in thinking about how to approach the idea of, of something that's disappearing uh, in, a, in the terms of landscape. Uh, so uh, one of the most sort of... Uh, um, I would say self-influential photographs that I took was during uh, my experience in graduate school when I traveled back to uh, Serbia, to, to then Yugoslavia after the uh, NATO bombing. In uh, uh, bombing was in 1999, and that this is the photograph that I took in two thousand summer of 2001. So it's uh, kind of one of these uh, bridges over the uh, Danube River, uh, but the life kind of continues even though the the uh, changes are evident and uh, things are not going to be exactly the same following this. Um, the first body of work that I'm kind of quickly going to address is the speculation world. Uh, this is the uh, group of images that I took uh, from the ground level and from the aerial uh, uh, photography point, uh, looking at the uh, arrested development of the housing market in Florida during the uh, economic bust and real estate bust in, in 2008 and 2009. And I was really always kind of uh, looking at how the how we relate to the landscape as as humans, as uh, citizens of this planet, uh, but also in terms of, of our cultural sort of uh, desires uh, and how do we translate that in our relationship to the landscape. Uh, another uh, larger body of work that uh, that kind of really addresses and it's really uh, based on this idea of lost more so than than anything else that I've been working on and it's also the uh, longest body of work that I that I have uh, actually created starting in roughly in 1999, is uh, uh, the idea of land loss in South Louisiana. So I've been photographing uh, the same area of, uh, of uh, Gulf of Mexico in South Louisiana, uh, looking at the uh, sort of gradual disappearance of this landscape uh, that's occupied mostly by um, First Nations, as well as uh, Cajun uh, groups in South Louisiana. So I'm looking at this as a sort of a uh, the sign of the of the uh, global 
rise of the of the oceans, but as well as the uh, kind of a political uh, uh, sort of the 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 effect of the political inaction uh, in this country. And this work really kind of takes me from uh, various different approaches to this landscape, from uh, large format uh, uh, photography to pinhole photography to color photography, video, and uh, ultimately, this is the latest work, is uh, uh, film photography with the uh, with the a uh, panoramic uh, six by twelve inches camera. All right. So that's my introduction. Thank you for that, Daniel. Um, does anybody have any questions for, for Daniel? For like immediate feedback. <laughs> that will. No. Okay. Um, next, Jen, if you'd like to go next. I'm unmuted. Yes. No. <laughs> You're okay. Um, I'm gonna move to to uh, sharing here in just a minute as well. I just um, I want to say real quickly. I want to thank uh, my colleagues in particular uh, to Easton for reaching out uh, to me uh, to participate in this. I'm as will become apparent in a moment. I am not an, an art practitioner or a photographer in the traditional sense. Um, I'm what you might call a humanist practitioner. Um, and a term that I've used in a program at Coastal that I've been directing for the last three years uh, called Digital Culture and Design called Critical Making. Um, so uh, I tinker and, and make alternative productions of texts and artifacts that I study, particularly some historically, but contemporary ones. And um, I work between analog, digital, and um, material making. Um, the theme of this festival is right in line with my interest in work. Um, I am fascinated by historically lost or uh, forgotten text objects, um, technology, central fascinations of mine. Um, and I think that, in fact, in the context of this global crisis that we're all facing right now, terrifying and costly as it is um, and ongoing, particularly in the United States, uh, has made clear to us that amid loss is recovery and discovery and even revisitations or remediations of lostness. Um, that is the productive loss, in some cases, of sterile modes of life, practices, or values. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. And I need to go ahead and pull this up. Can you all see that? Yes? Okay, um, assuming we're all muted so you can see this. So my work uh, focuses on lost media and texts and um, unlike the objects you see here, which are very early telescopes and microscopes, um, I'm particularly compelled by objects that are not just lost to time by being replaced or improved or discarded, um, but artifacts that enter a kind of cul-de-sac in history, uh, embodying obsolescence not necessarily because their usefulness was replaced or outlived, uh, but in the example I'm about to share and move quickly through here, uh, because they preceded or exceeded uh, their own moment. That is, uh, they were before or after um, their own moment in some way. Um, you might say they were lost to their own time in interesting ways, creatively lost to their own moment. So uh, for the last couple of years, I've been uh, interested with um, the texts and artifacts of a 17th century woman writer and experimentalist named Margaret Cavendish. Um, Cavendish was a print author. Uh, her use of that media form alone is its own really bizarre and fascinating story. Uh, but she was also a practitioner of perceptual science, meaning she, she basically played with microscopes and lenses and how such technologies literally changed how we saw the world. The implications for this for all sorts of really important intellectual questions is really, I can't go into it here, I hope to at some point, um, but is, is really has a lot of depth to it. 
Um, she wrote prolifically, uh, but one of her most underappreciated productions was a book that was uh, both a technical scientific treatise and a science fiction novel together in one book. Observations upon experimental philosophy to which is added the description of a new blazing world was an entirely confusing artifact for its time. Science and fiction mixed together. Designed as the author described it as a hermaphrodite text. Not just because it mixed science fictions with technical science, uh, but because the author had intended for the reader to mix and remix the two texts, creating what she called small worlds as she phrased them, of combined ideas. Science speaking to art, and uh, art speaking back to science in the same space. Of course, this is difficult to achieve with an early traditional book, bookmaking, two books in one, meant to literally be virtually remixed as a living work of science-inflected art. Uh, it was a project constrained by print, which was her medium of the moment. Uh, we can say that print was lost on Cavendish's project and that her work was lost in the moment with, uh, within which she created. As a humanist and tinkerer in digital media, I have tried to share in my work and with my students the notion that we should strive to find in digital technologies and mediations, not the flashy bright things related to newness and that oh so pro problematic term innovation, but explore more patiently what might be recovered in this form of materiality and what is lost on it or to it. Bethany Novisky has described this approach to digital making as a seeking of the places where there is resistance in the materials themselves. In an odd sense, Cavendish's aim at her moment was for a kind of moving hybrid hypertext, an open-ended set of images and narratives that will be shadows of each other, a particular theme in the science fiction text would correspond to one of many examples of that theme in the science treaties. Um, of course, hypertextual media was not available to her, but in her digital moment, we can see a version of Cavendish's text that is very close to her idealized descriptions. So we started this uh, experiment with a digital interface that allowed two texts to float next to one, one another with a keyword or term was chosen using an object-oriented database that's kind of um, handmade, if you will, in the way that uh, Cavendish had made many of her own books and self-published. Uh, images and passages from both texts can be mixed together as a new narrative, a sort of 17th century meets 21st century interactive bandersnatch. But as we played around further with the materiality of the mixing of digital tools and older 20th century models for art books and experimental book production, we came up with an idea for an even more playful interactive piece that allowed for an, anal an uh, analog digital text that experimented with the two texts literally ghosting one another on the same page. Oh, nice. Science fiction hovering under and over science and vice versa. So now the final prototype of this, uh, this project, an art book, is an actual physical edition that uh, is in dialogue with the hypertext, uh, produced by both digital and analog means, that playfully reproduces a scholarly version of decoder art books of the early 20th century. In this version, the texts are palimpsests of one another. A special playful little insert is held over the text and reveals the science fiction counterpart of the actual scientific treatise. This playful and yet historically meaningful experiment in remediating a lost artifact that existed virtually outside of its own time is meant to point to a different approach to the potential of digital art and research at our moment, a method both in conversation with past materialities using the digital not simply as a dazzling postmodern kaleidoscope, but as an aesthetic medium that can be employed to explore what is lost and recaptured as we move between old and new mediums. I'm stop sharing here. I have all sorts of interactive, wonderful materials I can share at another time. Um, let me go ahead and get out of this now. I'm having trouble leaving. <laughs> um, and that is my introduction. Okay, thank you so much. Super interesting. Um, and I am also very grateful for who, who your, your colleague was. Is it Easton who um, invited you along? Yeah, that's awesome to have yeah. you on board. Thank you so much. Um, would anybody like 
to um, ask any questions or have any immediate comments to Jen before we go to the next person. Okay, so if we go to Eastern next, if that's all right. Hi, okay. So introductions, Daniel, first, thanks for uh, calling me and saying, hey, would you like to be part of this project? It sounds very interesting. And thank you both uh, for hosting this festival virtually this year. It's, this is a lot of fun. Uh, when Daniel approached me about this project or this conversation about Lost, I was very confused about why he called me and said, hey, would you be interested in doing this? <laughs> and so, and then I, I finally realized, I'm like, oh, I'm completely lost in my work, <laughs> like completely lost because I don't know what I'm doing most of the time. And so uh, I figured that that's going to be my conversation about my own body of work that I have been fighting with for almost 15 years. So, um, and is this the time where we have the five minutes or is this the, to go through the slides, the, yeah. the 75 slides? I'm, I'm joking. I don't have 75 <laughs> slides anyway. So, all right, the entire screen. Dun, dun, dun. All right. So what I don't know is what you guys can see. Can you guys see anything? Yes, do you guys see the conjure screen? Just making sure we're clear. Awesome, <laughs> great. So. The body of work I'm going to talk about is called Conjure. Um, it is, this is its second or third variation iteration of this body of work. Um, a little bit of my background. I am from Mississippi. I am from the deep South. It is a very strange place. Uh, it's an interesting place, beautiful place, home of the Mississippi Delta blues, fried food, and, uh, you know, societal problems, if you will. So anyway, it's also highly religious. And I grew up in an upbringing that was also highly religious. And so I was always confused about my place within religion in the South, didn't quite get it. I grew up in Mississippi, going to New Orleans, Memphis, the Mississippi Delta, places like that. And in my making of work, I explored like the concept of religion, what it means to me, in all of the various forms that it came in. And it was always a complete struggle of how to deal with it. Um, years ago, I came across, uh, I met a hoodoo priestess conjurer outside of Charleston years ago. And I started looking into the concept of hoodoo, which is not voodoo. So Daniel is probably familiar with voodoo, spending his time down in Louisiana, but uh, they're very different in their organization. So I started thinking about like how religion functions for me and how it functions within the Southeast specifically. And so I started experimenting with the ideas of uh, trinkets within those different sort of ideologies. So these pieces are like additions to the other pieces that we just saw. These are large scale, uh, 38 by 38 uh, silver prints. Um, and but you can see my whole desktop. <laughs> Is there anything over there? Let's see, maybe we can just do this view full screen. Armana, is that better? Yeah. Okay, all right, sorry. Anyway, you don't need to see the, the minutia that's back there. Anyway, so this is another piece from that series. It's moving way too fast. Uh, but again, 38 by 38 silver gelatin prints coated in encaustic. This needs to stop. I'm totally falling apart right now. I'm gonna try and fix this. I'm sorry, Daniel, I'm ruining this for you. <laughs> All right, let's try one more time. All right, so these were roots. These are items, objects that I made and uh, I, it was a complete failure of a series because everything and anything I was trying to accomplish with it fell completely apart. And so I discovered a volume of books called Hoodoo Conjuration, Witchcraft and Root Work by Harry Middleton Hyatt. And this piece right here is an actual Hoodoo poppet 
that when I walked away from the series of work, I left it for about six years. I found the poppet in the middle of the woods, photographing some landscape work, and I came back to it. I was like, oh, okay, shit. Okay, this is real. <laughs> like, I actually found something in nature that I'm not supposed to find. I'm not supposed to have this, but I've, I'm going to keep this as an object. And it made me go back to the work uh, and re-explore the concept of root work and conjure. So in this series, what I've been doing and I've rediscovered this, I've refound this, I've decided to take on the, the idea of the root worker, the conjurer, and the practice of white and black magic as it relates to me, personal ideas of religion, philosophies, and made it into a much larger body of work that integrates three-dimensional pieces like poppets that are mummified, contained in these jars, uh, the black and white work is actually the practice of spells that are both black and white magic. And then the landscape work, the green, large, lush landscape work is supposed to give context to the place in which I found the original poppet. It was lush, it was green, it was tight, it was confined. And the work is ongoing. I'm still exploring it. I'm still adding to it because I still get lost in this work. And I have to find my way back to better understand myself, the body of work, and then where it's actually going. So it's got a lot of different layers to it. It is highly, it's a highly complicated body of work, I think. And uh, I'm still trying to find it. So yeah, including my artist statement, it's killing me, totally killing me. <laughs> so, and that's it. Wow, thank you. That that is super interesting. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a strange body of work because people don't know what to make of it, and so um, I've done a couple of lectures about the work, and when when I say that I take on the practice of conjure, people get really get scared because they say you're practicing magic, and I say yes. And they say, even black magic? And I look at them and say, yes. <laughs> and then people start getting worried about, are those poppets about me? Maybe. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Although one person has figured out which poppet is them. One person has figured it out. They're like, I know that that's me. I know that's me. And I had to tell them that they were correct. <laughs> so, wow. yeah. But anyway, so that's my work. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Has anyone got any questions for Ethan? Some comments on his work? He doesn't, he obviously doesn't no, want to he's answer gone. He's, just, he's <laughs> yeah. just done one for a little bit, so. <laughs> oh, he's back. <laughs> I promise that I know how to use technology. <laughs> I pressed the wrong red button. I do have a quick question. Yeah, man. Easton in practicing this magic. I don't know. Can you detail any kind of hairy experiences or like has, has something scary happened to you during this that you could describe? Yes. Do I have time? <laughs> so uh, the last black and white image that you see is it's one of the few landscape black and white images in the series, or at least at the moment. <clears throat> and the the background is uh, one e one weekend a friend of mine came to visit. We were about to go leave on another like documentary project that I've been working on, and he's a collaborator on that that piece or that body of work. He came in, saw my house was a mess. I've got chicken bones, chicken feet, like dead frogs, like snake skin. I mean, my house. I don't know why anybody would want to come into my house, <laughs> but he came in. And he said, so how's the work going? I said, I'm stuck. And he said, well, why are you stuck? I said, I've done all this stuff. Like it's not tying together the way it needs to. And he said, okay, well, what have you not done? And I said, honestly, I haven't gone down the road of black magic yet. And then his response was, what the hell is wrong with you? Why are you not doing this? What are you really afraid of? And I said, okay, well then, 
we have to try and summon the devil. So I, uh, I had to find a pure silver fork, which is very hard to come by these days uh, because everything is plated silver. Um, but what I decided is I went to, I'm, gonna, I'm working on loopholes here. If I'm going to work with the devil, I'm going to like semantically argue with him about things. I found a pure silver, new to me, bacon fork. And that's the fork that you saw that had sort of curved, that had the salt ring that's around it. Yeah, so followed the spell completely. We found a dirt road that was a crossroads, stuck the fork in the road. We had about $30,000 in audio video equipment with us because we were going to film this just to make sure that we're covered. What was not on the radar that evening was the storm that arrived. So as we're driving to this space outside of Conway, you know, rural Horry County, South Carolina, we're look, we look in the distance and we're like, what is that in the distance? And it was a massive lightning storm. So we get to the spot that we were supposed to go to. We get the fork in the ground and straight line winds at like 40 miles an hour we're going through. We were five minutes from the midnight point where we start going through the process of like the ceremony, if you will. Hail started coming down, rain started coming down. And then we both were, there were three of us that were there because I did call a friend and said, hey, we're summoning the devil tonight. Do you want to come? He said, sure. What time do I need to be there? <laughs> so, you know, we got, we were literally three minutes from the point of like actually making the thing happen. And my two friends who have no fear both said, we have to leave. We are going to get stuck here. The storm is bad. I'm looking at the radar. It's going to be really bad. We have to get out of here. So I got one picture. And that was the shot of the fork in the middle of the road before we actually got to call on the devil. So yeah, that kind of stuff. I mean, there's been other things too. That's the fun story. Yeah. Wow. And me, and me. Wow. Just... <laughs> scary. That is scary. It's all perspective, right? Yeah. So I figured that if he had shown up, I would have been like, so what's it like being you? <laughs> I, don't, I don't need anything. I just figured, I just wanted to see if you were real. That's it. <laughs> I was going to say, did you, did you have like a list of questions prepared, ready? Yeah, well, I figured that if he actually did show up, then he's okay with bacon and a pure silver bacon fork. So it was going to work. If he didn't show up, I was going to blame him for being too picky. And so, uh, you know... I had a bunch of random questions. What's it like to be you? Were you really thrown out? Seriously? <laughs> Why did you do that? So was it worth it? So, and then I was going to ask if there were other people that were down there that I might know. <laughs> so. Cool. That's awesome. Were you tempted to do it again? Oh yeah. I mean, it's going to happen again. It's just a matter of time. So it's uh, getting, you know, a video crew back again because we're gonna i mean this has to happen like the audio and the video is pretty it's pretty wild because you see like the wind and the trees moving back and forth like this you start to see the rain just coming down in sheets like at an angle a sharp angle I mean, it was it was a really wild experience so i when i told that story to next at an, an exhibition and someone walked up to me afterwards turns out the guy was a minister he said you do know that was divine intervention i said was it or was it a you know a freak storm that showed up? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, oh, it's me again. Oh. It's actually you, but it can be me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you, Ethan. That was, yeah, that was mind blowing. You're actually speechless. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> that I'm, never happened. Like I'm really intrigued to find out more. Yeah, yeah. Um. Joshua. Okie dokie. So, Joshua next. Are you prepared? I think I am. Are y'all prepared? That's the question. We're going to go through about 15 years of photography in about three minutes, uh, just as a, a kind of visual onslaught of information. So I hope that that, that works well with everybody. Are you going to 
So hopefully y'all can see this well. If not, somebody scream at me because I can't see you anymore. Um, but I'm going to go through kind of talk about how, how I find myself lost all the time. When Daniel first asked me, kind of like Easton, I was like, I don't know if my work does that. But then I was like, oh, yeah, every single thing I've done for the last decade and a half does exactly that. Uh, so thanks a lot, uh, Daniel, for realizing how lost I am all the time. So I'm going to start just talking about my beginnings. Uh, I started out lost um, from the very beginning. I moved for something like 30 times by the time I was 30 years old. And I spent uh, my undergraduate years wandering between different colleges and universities trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, I studied everything from computer science to criminal justice and finally ended up uh, on microbiology. But that was all upended when my mom bought me a camera. Uh, and kind of ruined my hopes for gainful employment for the for the rest of my life. Um, and that was it. So I, I started over, basically. I went to a school in Kentucky for four years for photography. And while I was there, uh, I learned a lot. And I, I really value my experiences there. They changed my entire outlook on the world. Uh, and I had just started to get to know my grandfather as a man. Um, you know, he's a, he was my grandpa, he took us to church, he bought us candy, uh, he was a sign painter, but I just kind of knew him in an abstract way. Um, but he was this link that we had to church, to family, um, and he taught me a lot. And he, uh, his health started to, to decline just as I was finishing my undergraduate studies. And I began photographing him uh, abstractly and uh, representationally and um, trying to understand his his life um, and so there were there was a series trying to reconcile science and religion and family um, and and his kind of own humanity so this was just a few moments before he died I watched that vein in his neck pulse all night and slowly it started to get uh, more and more distant in between pulses until it finally stopped and I, I felt really conflicted about this work and these images, I didn't bring my camera. I turned around and went home and uh, cried and came back and got the camera and met my family in the parking lot. And they insisted that I photograph them because they knew that it was a way that I would be able to connect to that situation that was happening. So that was right at the end of my undergrad. And I knew that I was going to be leaving. Uh, and so I photographed my friends and loved ones that I was going to be uh, leaving behind as I moved across the country. And I had been lost up to that point, but this was the first time that I was conscious that I was going into a situation where I would have no, uh, no kind of compass or bearings whatsoever. Um, I was separated in Arizona from everyone that I knew and loved and was having a really hard time trying to figure out what to photograph. So I just kind of wandered, uh, just literally would walk around with my camera photographing everything uh, and anything. Um, and I was in a whole new landscape, a new climate. I had no idea how to navigate the hot, harsh, hateful uh, environment of the desert. The desert wants you to die. It doesn't it doesn't have an ambivalent opinion about it. It wants you to die so that it can steal your resources. Uh, and I had a really hard time in that environment. Uh, throughout graduate school, the work that I made focused on memory. Um, and the, my thesis show was a body of mixed media work entitled In Search of Lost Time that focused on how we attempt to save our most precious memories. Uh, the kind of lengths that we go to to protect them. This piece is called She's Been Gone These Five Long Years, and it's a lock of hair protected under uh, five bell jars. Uh, and all the while that we're trying to protect these memories, we're destroying them. Um, and so kind of meditating on that, that duality of loss and memory. After graduate school, I moved to Pennsylvania to live near my wife's family as we started our own family and found myself again without bearings. I didn't have a community or resources and began making these pictures of everything around me, uh, kind of foreign objects and, and looking at myself as a stranger in this new place, even though it was a relatively familiar landscape, but trying to immerse myself in it uh, and just understand my new location. And through making these images, I began to have an understanding that my photographs were asking questions about how do I belong to a place. And they were the way that I was able to try to reconcile uh, how I navigate through a new space. 
if you can't tell already, I make images in a multitude of ways that respond to those ideas. And all the time I'm trying to, to pull in different aspects of what I see and what I experience. So images like these lumen prints are made from subjects that I find and usually made on site. So the sunlight that creates the image is the same sun that shone on that butterfly when it was alive uh, and trying to tie those those poetics of location together where I'm in the place where I'm making the image using that same sunlight and these same objects. Uh, we moved our family to Boone, North Carolina a few years after we moved to Pennsylvania. And as soon as we got here, somebody told me that the New River is the oldest river in the world. And that was, that blew my mind. Uh, it's not true. It's not the oldest river in the world, but it is a really old river. And just the idea that I live in this place uh, and kind of like Easton thinking about religion in the Southeast and how I grew up, uh, I almost became an evangelical kind of fire and brimstone screaming preacher um, and then didn't do that. Uh, started to have a lot of questions about the way I was raised and, and our religion kind of fundamental evangelical Christianity, but living in this place where it almost felt like the Garden of Eden with this ancient river and these mountains and lush landscape and how religion tied into all that. Um, it's not, it's not, uh, that I, that I use photography to understand my place wholly, but it's a way that I try to navigate situations that allow me to understand more what it is like to function in these places I find myself and trying to situate myself in the South and Appalachia in the mountains and all the other descriptors of my new home has been really challenging and disorienting, uh, conflicting feelings all the time about uh, culture and, and religion and all the different things that come together to make up the South. In these times of uncertainty, I often will turn to science and nature rather than God, although maybe they're the same thing and it just depends on your perspective. Uh, these images, these next couple of images are a series called There Are Other Worlds Than These that are my meditations on exoplanets and uh, what it might look like to find other worlds we could move to and how that only underscores and emphasizes our responsibility to the planet that we have here to take care of. I look for signs not to show me the way, but remind me to keep searching and to hold tight. <laughs> I consider cycles and think about the earth and things that I can touch. I think about the people I meet and human relationships. And I find myself drawn closer to home. And that's my website. Okay. Thank you very much, Joshua. Thanks, Joshua. Yeah, thank you all for that. Questions or feedback, Joshua? Oh, Josh, I feel like you and I should have a chat sometime, <laughs> like talk. We've got we have a lot of overlap in you know our work in some capacity. So here we are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's interesting that you're like how how you explore the world through, and I'm interested in how you choose processes for certain things, because like some of it looks like it's play, um, but some of it looks like it's also intentional. So is there, how much of the, is there overlap between the play and then the intent, or is it all play? I don't know. I, I mean, I think that play gets a uh, bad reputation, uh, not amongst present company, or at least the ones that I know. Uh, but I think that, you know, historically, the idea of play has been that it's frivolity and that it's not intentional or serious. Uh, with some of the work, like, for instance, with lumen prints or um, with those planets, those little round things, uh, that, is, that starts as play. But then I uncover threads while I'm working with it. So those, those little planets just started as scans of objects that I found. And then I started working through some ideas with them and then creating the objects, you know, myself, um, and, and following that along. Some of it's really intentional. The last work I showed was wet plate collodion. And I am using that on purpose, not just because it looks cool or it's old or I, I value the process. Um, but you know, I mentioned poetics of, of place and landscape. And I love the idea that I bring these chemicals out into the field onto a farm and I use the water from that farm and the sunlight and the air and the people and that, that artifact from that interaction 
persists as the evidence that I was there, that they were there. Um, and it's a different kind of, of feeling. Um, and I, you know, I use everything. I use my iPhone, I use a scanner, I use a camera from the early 1900s. Uh, and it's not even so much that I consciously try to choose a process. It's that I, 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 a lot of times I'll have an idea and I'll go make something, but more often I'll, I'll be playing with the process and, and something will reveal itself to me, how it can be applied to, to an idea that's kind of swimming around. And that, that two and a half minute, 14 process introduction is a pretty good, um, pretty good exploded view of what it's like inside my brain because it's not just like I go out and make this kind of picture I don't even understand how I make all those and in the same person and sometimes I feel bad about that I feel like um, like I should pick a lane you know like I should just do one thing but I, I don't that's not how I work I'm drawn to these different processes because they allow me to explore these ideas in different visual ways That's a really interesting comment. Um, I know I'm not here as an artist, particularly I'm here kind of to host, but um, I was intrigued by your work anyway because um, I have a huge thing about the loss of play and loss of curiosity in um, just in life. Like people are just damn miserable. Like, you know, they don't, it's like they don't understand how much joy and how much it kind of brings life to stuff to play, you know? So that's really interesting. But then what you just said about different processes, this is like my head all the time. <laughs> so like I'm, I'm mixed media and I work in loads of different ways. And I feel like people go to one of my shows and they're like, yeah, you should probably just pick one, you know, and like get on with it. Yeah. And I, yeah, I can't, it's just not the way I work. So it's really kind of validating <laughs> to um, have you here. <laughs> Um, okay, so next, are we okay to go to Ritty? Cool. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, this is my first time, and also this is my first opportunity to be selected with Lacuna. So thank you for that. I I am really happy with uh, with. Uh, with the festival, the response, and also that it's happening virtually, <laughs> not physically, but virtually, at least it's happening. Um, so I'm originally from India, and I moved to the UK after marriage. Uh, I normally paint uh, landscapes. I'm a landscape artist. I never studied art. I'm self-taught artist. Um, still learning, though. Uh, um, I did my master's uh, when I was in India and I was working in HR and I was used, I, I always used to paint from a picture. I, I, I scrolled on my phone on Pinterest and uh, you know, if, I, if I like a picture and I, I started painting a picture. So that was my hobby kind of thing. But then after moving to the UK, I just visited so many art galleries and looked around and there were so many artists there are so many artists in so, uh, only in Leamington Spa. There are so many that I just it just motivated me to go further with it. So um, I just uh, started taking it seriously before two three years, I think. So I uh, joined local art class to improve my techniques and skills. Um, so I have so far painted my uh, in in oil pastels, um, in uh, oil colors, acrylics, and watercolors. Uh, do some sketches as well. The thing is that my uh, this is my work laptop, and I can't I don't have anything stored on my work laptop, so I can't share a screen. But I have got few paintings with me, which I can show you if. So sorry about the glare, if you can see. Ah, uh, this is our one. Mm -hmm. Is it visible? Yes. Yeah. So this is a painting which is selected for Lacuna and currently exhibiting uh, virtually. This is a place uh, from my hometown in India. It's a fort. 
which was uh, built in 1745. And um, uh, basically, the fort is now not really preserved over there where I live. And uh, there's a big, huge tree. You can see the gate in there, the entrance. And the whole thing is covered with with a huge banyan tree. You know banyan tree, yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so it's all covered with the roots of banyan tree branches. And so, it, so when I visited India, I just visited in January. And um, on Facebook post, I saw Lacuna Festival's Lost Theme. And visiting India, I just thought that, oh, this is perfect for the festival. I should go for it and just, just paint it. I tried to paint it in oil pastels uh, to give it an abstract look. Like, so luckily, I got selected, which was good. Um, Another painting, this is uh, ink on um, acrylics. It's a Hindu god, uh, a god with three eyes, one, two, and three. And he's the main god <laughs> in India. <laughs> so people say that if he opens his third eye, if he is angry and if he opens the third eye, then something bad can happen in the whole world, like destruction thing. So I don't know if it's the truth, but that's 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 the saying. Um, this is oil on canvas panel. Yeah, the, uh, it's a, I just named it as a busy morning. So I was going to work, and I just saw people were so. I was stuck in a traffic and people were just so busy going to work. And it was nice and sunny spring day. So I just thought to paint it as a busy morning. Uh, this is my recent work, uh, watercolor on paper. Uh, it's a garden from my row, um, not a rose from my garden, sorry. <laughs> and this is Durdle Door. Does anyone know? Yeah. So a really nice place. So these are all A4 paintings, but I normally um, do a bigger ones as well. If you see the one which is behind, kind of A3 size, it's too shiny. <laughs> and I've got some more which are downstairs and on the walls. I can't really remove it <laughs> but uh, uh, they are all posted on my instagram pages and on my website as well so yes that's it really i think <laughs> cool. i hope it was good <laughs> yeah that was lovely thank you Bruti. Does that's okay any, any questions or comments for Bruti? So how do you choose your subject matter? Um, that's a good question. I don't really uh, choose a subject. It's uh, like on the go. If I see a view of a landscape and if it attracts me, I just take a picture of it and then I paint it. So at the moment, I don't have anything like a, I haven't painted any series kind of thing or um, on, on a particular subject. But I, I will definitely do it later on. <laughs> Thanks. I like, I get a sense that you're kind of, um, yeah, you're kind of holding stuff so that you don't lose it. And I quite like that, you know. Um, <laughs> Thank you. When we saw your piece of the, is it a fort or a castle? Yes, it, fort. Yeah. yeah. And it's being kind of totally reclaimed by that tree. That's kind of quite a powerful, a powerful image. So thank you for, for sharing that, some more. Thank you work. for, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, of course. Um, and finally, last but not least, of course, um, Armin, you're up. Thank you very much. Uh, my mic is back on there. Um, 
much like uh, many people before me have said, um, you know, thank you for this opportunity. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, I will also note that while many of the, a few of the other people here I've known for a while, uh, Easton and I have known each other for, uh, I don't know, 10, 12 years, something along those lines. It's been a while now. Uh, and I assure you that I will not be uh, with him when he summons the devil again. Uh, my minister mother would uh, never forgive me. And uh, <laughs> when, why take chances? <laughs> what? I'll just I'll wait for the video to come out. Josh, you can film that for us or something. I don't know. You, I'll let y'all handle that. <laughs> um, but uh, so today, uh, I guess what I wanted to, I guess, just spend a little bit of time talking about um, is um, a body of work that kind of connects back to this idea of lost. Um, for me, um, I... Um, uh, have been riding motorcycles uh, since I was about 19 years old. Um, and um, as I've gotten um, older, um, I have become more and more kind of involved in that community and that culture. Um, and one of the things that has always um, kind of been important to me in that space is um, where minorities sit within that community. Um, and um, the aspect of um, kind of a, a lost narrative of those people um, that within this group, um, they have largely been ignored, right? Um, by kind of the, the mass or kind of unknown to some extent. Um, I think that's kind of changing um, in the larger scope of, of what motorcycle culture is becoming, um, but within a larger history and context of it. So I wanted to start exploring that both in um, the work itself um, as as a method to produce um, imagery, um, but also as a way for kind of finding myself, right? Um, there's, to, to a certain degree, a certain amount of um, lostness that, um, that this project kind of became a therapeutic method for me for, right? In the sense of um, being African-American in, um, in academia, in the art world, um, our population is very small um, in, in, in a lot of circles. Um, and there's always been this kind of place where I have felt lost um, or unheard or like a, a soul voice. Um, so this, this body of work kind of became this kind of therapeutic method to kind of engage that space in myself, but also um, a way to start examining how that was also um, kind of engaged uh, and end up with in this other space that I was now kind of functioning in. So, I'm going to hop right into this work. Let's see if I can get this to the right screen. How are we going to bring this together into a discussion? Because after his presentation. All right, I'm going to assume everybody can see this. Because now I can't see you guys, because now all I see is my own presenter screen. Okay, um, so uh, this body of work, um, Slaughter Black Bikers, uh, The End of Daniel Lion and Cultural Refuge, um, and subtitled People of Color Within, uh, People of Color Lost Within a Subculture. Um, so this work was, like, as, as I mentioned, was really about kind of examining, um, primarily began as examining um, the black bike culture within subculture, within a subculture. Um, and their kind of lost identity, but at the same time, um, really grew into examining minorities as a whole, because one of the things that we find is, um, particularly black, what are traditionally known as black motorcycle clubs, um, have really expanded to really become more kind of minority motorcycle clubs, um, and don't necessarily isolate themselves um, as much as what we would think of as traditionally Caucasian motorcycle clubs do. Um, so uh, a little background on the project, um, the image of the biker as established by Danny Lyons, 1969 series, the bike riders has marked a moment in American history and helped create a common identity for stereotype. This persona has since lost its foothold in mass culture of motorcyclists, leaving those involved to constantly combat the ideas put forth by such images. The black biker is a figure that stands in contrary to Lyons' work and marks a dec decidedly significant shift in the contemporary context of society and an end to Lyons' vision. Um, 
I'd use that just as a way to say the one of the big emphasis for this body of work was really building off of Danny Lyons' work, the bike, the the bike riders. Um, this um, I think has been the kind of driving force of um, uh, of what we have established um, as motorcycle culture visually. Um, kind of the stereotypes that that have surrounded it um, really helped to be established by this work of, of lions. Um, and um, particularly the idea of the outlaw, right, community and the rebel and right, all those things um, that kind of come along and have come, come along with that. I'm not going to read through this, but it's just a state that one of the, 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 the place that is, was kind of missing in lions work um, and is largely missing in popular media and popular assumption, right, of motorcycle biker culture um, is minorities, um, and in this case, um, particularly African Americans, right? Um, but we see that um, established in film, um, this kind of um, imagery and stereotype through a um, history of things uh, real quickly, um, some of the more popular ones that have been out there over the years, um, some which many of you have probably seen, um, the wild one kind of being the, the, the first really big one starring Marlon Brando, um, the wild angels, uh, starring Peter Fonda, um, and Nancy Sinatra, Satan sadist, um, easy rider, um, probably being the most, most largely kind of international, the, to receive the most international, um, acclaim. Um, and to some degree really became the one that then pushed, that kind of stereotype and persona into an international um, perspective. Um, we also saw it in television uh, in shows like um, Sons of Anarchy with its widespread success. Um, right, but these ideas just kind of continue to establish this kind of sense of um, this kind of sense of um, of, of kind of outlaw danger to society. Um, you know, threat and, and things of that sort um, that have kind of largely dominated right, what people have thought about this culture. Um, you know, and we see images like this from some of the you know, more popular clubs, Hells Angels, Manditos, um, 1% clubs, things of that sort, as apparently my work phone decides to go crazy today. Um, but, you know, what this does is it really helps create the space where um, these, you know, these images um, and this kind of persona that's created um, really um, kind of helps to kind of help help to solidify this idea um, that motorcycle culture was really all Caucasian. Um, and um, so I've sought to kind of tell a different story um, and find a new way to tell the story. Um, uh, some quick examples of Lyons' work. Of course, these were silver gelatin photographs. Um, I'll move through these quickly. Um, but just, uh, you know, Lyons really photographed from with inside uh, the Chicago Outlaws. Um, he was one of the first to kind of be allowed within that space to, to photograph with them and kind of ride with them. And kind of, even though he wasn't a motorcycle rider himself, but just kind of be around them constantly. Um, but one of the few things we see in his work are images like this, which are like very directly engaging with the singular person, or in this case, two people, where you feel like there's um, a connection being made with the camera and with the maker of the images. Um, so that was the direction that I decided to take for this work. So this are, these are now examples of the work that I produced, um, again, being silver gelatin photographs. These were shot digitally, um, and then digital negatives produced, and then printed in a dark room in order to connect them physically also back to a photo history um, and also to the work of Lion. Um, and uh, really the goals of these images, again, I won't read this fully, but to summarize, um, is really to um, show black bikers as um, individuals, as people of, um, as members of our community, um, as um, the people themselves, but also um, as a member of their club or their um, MC motorcycle club. Um, and by showing kind of both sides of these people at once um, to kind of give the example that um, there are these dual sides that we see to everyone, right? There's not this stereotype that can be cast over, um, over the, a, a larger culture as a whole. Um, so 
um, this body of work started um, actually with people who I was kind of close to, um, who I ride with fairly frequently. While I'm not a member of a motorcycle club, I know a lot of motorcycle clubs across the country. Um, I do lots of cross-country trips and um, things that sort during the summer, so I'm constantly kind of connecting with people. And whether it's at events or on one-on-one situations or on individual rides, I can kind of... Um, stop people and ask them for their photo and things of that sort um, and kind of give them a little kind of introduction to the project themselves. Um, and most of them, for the most part, really want to be part of the project because they want to help kind of spread this message. Yeah. So actually this image here and then the next one are father and son. Um, so again, showing this aspect of, of family um, and how important you know, that um um, that can be within the the culture itself um, as well. Um, cleared two different clubs, but um, so there's that connection. This is actually uh, a cousin of the older gentleman. Um, so we even see it expanding into I'm um, including kind of women as a part of this minority, um, this larger kind of minority conversation, where we see a lot of them holding um, kind of equal role in. Um, minority or black motorcycle clubs. Um, whereas in a lot of very, in a lot of traditional, particularly, um, what we, what we refer to as 1% or outlaw motorcycle clubs, Caucasian motorcycle clubs, um, they are rarely allowed to hold an equal position. Um, but are known as property of the club or of a certain member of the club. Um, and then this expands out into people who I've met um, just in various, as I mentioned, on various trips, on events, and various things along those lines. Um, again, wanting to continue to showcase um, these two sides of people. Um, I also thought of new ways to kind of format this body of work. One of the um, things that I found was as I kind of continued to connect with people and engage them, they people started coming to me and I kind of became known as the guy doing this project. Um, and they wanted to be part of it. They wanted to have pictures of the club taken, or this is a, another father and son who the um, father is the president of a motorcycle club in Texas. And the son uh, was just getting his, um, was officially no longer a prospect and was getting his colors, um, which is what we refer to as the, the vest with the patch um, and your name and, and location and things on it. Um, so this was kind of something I put together um, to kind of capture that moment. Um, and then again, these kind of group images began to emerge. So one of the things I found that uh, was that while I was seeking a message of kind of individualism, um, what I was losing was really this kind of community and the larger uh, sense of kind of bonding together as a whole and the importance of what the clubs also meant to the individuals. Um, so there was this other sense of loss that was happening there, um, even from the side of the maker. Um, so kind of beginning to let them, um, kind of become part of the project, um, and really, um, kind of help define how these images were made to some extent and, and open up uh, a way of seeing and thinking, um, to methods that I necessarily wasn't, um, became a really kind of important part of this engagement and became an important part of how these were being built. Um, and as it kind of began to con or continue to explore this idea, it also gave me a chance to explore a history of black motorcyclists, um, and particularly in the, in the, in the States, um, and um, all the way back to the what is thought of as the first black motorcycle club, the East Bay Dragons, which there's, I think there's a shot of one guy in here from that, um, from that organization, um, and the the development of that. And one of the big reasons for that was post really post Vietnam war. Um, while we saw an explosion of particularly biker clubs, motorcycle clubs across the country. Um, a lot of that was because it was so many soldiers that had returned from war and they felt lost. They felt like they didn't have a home. They felt like they had lost that sense of, of community and um, kind of tight knit culture that they'd had in the, in the, in the military. Um, and also, and oftentimes, so many of them suffered from other issues, which of course were, you know, at the time undiagnosed, but, um, you know, ment uh, mental um, conditions as a result of, you know, war. But so depression and isolation and P PTSD and things of that sort. Um, that it really gave them a sense of, of bonding and a way to start to almost self, not self medicate, but self treat some of those things. Um, and um, in that same space, as those communities formed, 
you began to see more African American clubs and more black clubs, more minority clubs form because it was a way in which to create pockets of safety. Um, for the most part, um, um, black motorcycle clubs weren't welcome um, in areas that were dominated by um, uh, primarily, you know, white motorcycle clubs or that had a very deep rooted um, sense of um, control over an area. There is a very deep and um, elaborate um, kind of hier hierarchy that exists in the motorcycle club community and really the motorcycle world in general um, involving um, clubs and, and their territories and, and who's allowed to be in places and who's not and, and various things along those lines, um, which in a more extended version of this, I kind of talk about. Um, but because of that, you really saw this emergence of black motorcyclists and um, black motorcycle clubs in order to kind of create these pockets of community and safety um, and ways that eventually then grew into the communities of where those people lived. Um, and in those communities, they became protectors, they became um, people, uh, community leaders, they became mentors um, and people who did more than just road motorcycles, they became people who really established um, a way to maintain culture and community um, and a space that kind of created a, a niche of their own. So um, that being said, um, that's kind of that body of work and um, how it kind of, um, again, ties into that idea of, of kind of loss in both in a sense of self and this idea of right, examining this culture from a um, from an insider perspective. So, thanks. Cool, thanks, Harmon. Um, does anyone have any any questions or responses to to Armin's work? And at some point, I'm still waiting to get Daniel out for motorcycle rides. So, <laughs> so Armin, I've got a quick question. So, the clubs that you're focusing on generally ride cruisers what about where does the sport bike community fit so some of those are actually sport bike clubs that run there there's at least two of them that were adrenaline junkies and uh la deuces are both primarily um cruiser clubs or, or sorry sport bike clubs um uh there's not as much definition which is one of the other things I've, that I realized there's not as much definition between those two things and black motorcycle clubs. Um, and I think a lot of it is number one, the, that kind of need of um, culture over, maybe I want to say community over culture. I don't know. I mean, maybe well, I want to phrase that. I'm, I need to rethink that. But, um, but what we mostly see in those clubs is like, Kind of a very traditional idea. A lot of the older guys ride cruisers. A lot of the younger guys ride sport bikes. Um, and then your back starts to hurt one day, um, and you make the switch. Um, but I mean, but for the most part, there's that distinction isn't as heavy um, in that space. I mean, you'll you'll notice that the activities vary, of course. You know, there's you know motorcycle races and various things of that sort. You know, that are more you know common amongst the you know the more sport bike dominant clubs. Um, but there's not really an inner sense of um, separation. Are you a, are you a sport bike or a cruiser? I'm a cruiser. I have a Harley Road King. Nice. So. Hey, Armin, um, are you um, planning in any any new trips um because there is like a um you're probably familiar with uh the uh, uh what is it caramel curves from new orleans yeah it's a old lady mm -hmm. uh club right yeah there's caramel curves and there's a couple clubs down there that i've been hoping to connect with so at some point i've yeah. um, I've, I've met a few of them there was an uh, event in biloxi last year and i met a few of them um, and I actually had stopped this project for a while and people kept coming back to me and wanting me to take their picture. So yeah. now like about a year ago, I started photographing again, but I took probably two, almost three years off. Um, and, um, a lot of it was just because I, I started doing 
I started doing a lot longer trips of my own and kind of started uh, another project kind of about kind of uh, national identity um, mm -hmm. and meeting people on the road. So I kind of tried to step away um, from the motorcycle stuff a little bit, but it keeps, um, and even that work I'm photographing from a motorcycle, um, <laughs> so, but it keeps pulling me back into it. So um, I'm kind of stepping back into it again and, and, and picking it back up. So um, I'll be making my way down, you know, down to Louisiana to photograph some of that stuff. And then also connecting with um, even like the, kind of black cowboy culture down there. I want to mm -hmm. kind of see how those two things kind of speak to each other a little bit. Um, and uh, finding ways that these communities can kind of branch and speak and, and have parallels. So, yeah. Yeah, in terms of, of sort of working on a, on long-term projects, uh, I find that, yeah, mm. you know, we're uh, just like that previous conversation about like staying within your own medium and that we're almost like pushed into that um and i've never really um like subscribed to that in 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 the same way that i've worked in ceramics i worked in video i worked in um you know photography and also i've been always sort of trained to say like oh not so much trained but i, I accepted the idea that like um, you choose your medium for the content of the work, yeah. And and uh, and in a lot of ways. So to get back to to the to the uh, the way of working on the on on the work um, over a specific amount of time versus over you know keeping keeping the work going, uh, not necessarily keeping it going, but being flexible enough to get back to it um, when there is a pause, but then that pause itself, sort of whatever it is, a year or two years, reinforms that work in some way. And I, uh, I find that I, like in my experience, I work on two or three open bodies of work, you know, and eventually you kind of, it's it, in my way, I was like, well, it's, it's fine to, for one, disconnected body work to re to to inform the other one that i stopped working on and to get me act, uh, you know interested to get back to it um and i think uh a lot of us sort of photo people uh at least in this group tend to work in that way and i find that that's why i'm like really attracted to your guys's work because <laughs> <laughs> you know there's not necessarily that like okay this is an assignment and i'm going to be done with it within six months and that's the work that I'm going to publish or put up in, you know, some kind of a very recognizable, very sort of formulaic work. Um, because I don't think necessarily that, that, you know, work of any sort needs to be formulaic. And, uh, but we, I do agree with Sarah Jane. We're sort of like almost pushed into that. Um, interestingly enough. But that's just my side comment for this. And yeah, by the way, uh, as soon as that uh, Honda is finished in a couple of months, yeah. All right, ready. all right. I'm looking forward to it. Well, I mean, it's um, you know, just along those lines. It's um, you know, I think one of the things doing watching everybody here, you know, today, you know, I think one of those things that you kind of talk about in that idea of this, these extended bodies of work, um, particularly in context of the sense of loss of being, you know, of in different ways is um, to really examine, I think, an idea in depth, um, particularly something that that you feel either disconnected from or isolated from, or you're seeking to like pull information from places that aren't commonplace, you know, then it takes that time. You know, it takes that kind of development of the message and then kind of putting it out there for people to, to, to digest and process in a, in a manner that begins to inform them um, in a way that they can understand it, right? It's like they have to learn, it's almost like they have to learn the, the issue, then the conversation, and then the solution. It's like it, it's these, you know, steps that have to happen along the way. I mean, so I think this, this method of, um, you know, building these things over time that so many of us are dealing with, um, I think just make a lot of sense um, in context to the subjects, you know, that we're approaching.
maybe we should just take our lead from that kind of last point, actually, because that's surely um, a conversation in itself. It's, you know, it's something that's kind of not a commonality across everybody, but something that perhaps everyone would be able to comment on is this idea of, of time and work and I'm somebody who tends to go back to things again and again and again. But what I find personally is there's um, a sense of there's a sense of loss in between the periods that I'm working, and then I feel like it's kind of difficult to get to grips with it again. And I I worry that maybe I've lost I don't know stuff in the middle that I should have been working on or doing or thinking about it. Or so I just wondered those people who are working kind of longer term your kind of um, reflections on that and if that is part of your work or if that is just something that seemed pertinent because it's something that's kind of relevant to, to my practice. So, um, yeah, I think that, so my, my audio just went really strange, so I don't, something happened. Anyway, um, you know, when, when I leave bodies of work, cause like Daniel said, like I've, I have multiple bodies all open at the same time and I jump between them and like the conjure root work series, I left for six years, I think. And, um, it wasn't like, I started thinking about that again. And then it wasn't until I found that, that poppet that things sort of respond, I guess, uh, but I don't think that I lost anything in that downtime uh, because it was other stuff that got explored that's linked in conceptually to that work. It was documentary style work, but there's, you know, there are tie-ins to a lot of those things too, because I think it's our general interest and it goes back to the idea of play that if you don't explore, you don't play, you don't experiment. Um, those are going to lead into either new ideas or evolve old ideas into something stronger or better. I wanted to just follow up on something because there seems to be a thread uh, throughout in talking about, um, Daniel used this concept earlier about potential in action. And, and that certainly is, is, is framed in sort of the conceptual ideas. But I'm, I'm really interested in thinking about these things too. And sort of, I feel like sometimes in these practices, um, the, the medium, and, and I love, you know, I, I think everybody would embrace this idea that we, we should move across media cross mediums and modalities. But I think sometimes we tend to assume those a kind of static framing in a way that we give more activity to the conceptual change. So that the conceptual changes, if we talk about coming back to it, it's coming back to the idea or coming back to the concept. And I, you know, one of the things that, that's been most exciting for me about working with digital media is that it's taken so for granted and it's so hidden and it's so evil in that regard, right? And yet when you get in the background of it, you find that there's things like these old object-oriented databases that are very glitchy and crappy and don't work, but they, they make interesting art and make interesting text when you try to use them in various ways. So I think it's really interesting to kind of go back and think about different media in that regard too, right? You know, how the sort of, you know, particular sort of Photo, the photo that you're taking and, and the process that you're using, that too is this potential in action that you're going back and revisiting with the concept. Sure. Even I think uh, that, um, like uh, Sarah said, that feel lost in between painting. I do. I I feel the same while doing one painting, especially if it's a bigger piece, and I. If I can't find the right color, and then I'm completely lost. And for a couple of days, I'm just thinking and thinking, oh, what, what is the right color for this? So after a couple of days, I had to go back to find what the proper color is. And it, it happens with me so many times. So it's just a thing of learning, I think. And uh, especially with these shadows and reflections, I feel so difficult. <laughs> I think that the benefit for me of working on a lot of different projects and so many different processes is that it it gives my brain a little it's weird to think of it as a break to move to a different process but I I think that as artists at least I tend to focus so intensely on whatever it is I'm doing that a 
a change is as good as a rest in that circumstance where I'm able to move kind of fluidly between these processes. And I don't necessarily feel a loss when I leave something for a while. Um, it, it almost is like, you know, absence making me grow fonder for it so that I can come back to it fresh. Uh, and sometimes that, I, I don't know if you all experience this. I imagine that you do, but there's this kind of funny thing that people were passing around at our university where it's like the life cycle of the artist. And it's like, this is great. I, I'm so excited to work on this. This is shit. I'm shit. Uh, and then it kind of goes down and it's like, no, this is okay. And I, I, I certainly always am fighting that and experiencing it where I'm so excited about this fresh idea. And then I work on it for a while. I'm like, th what a stupid thing for a grown man to do. Uh, and then I come back to it and I'm like, no, it's okay. Uh, and I think it allows me to, to kind of move in those undulations. I think that um, that cycle, yeah, is definitely. I've seen, I've seen the thing, but also I've seen it passed around as well. Like when I was, and before, before memes and gifts and stuff were even a thing, I saw it scrawled on some students' work when I was um, teaching at the at the art college in Leeds. Um, so yes, I think that's kind of ingrained in artists. <laughs> I think it's part of us. But what you said about like having a like a change or like, yeah, a change is as good as a rest. It's like um, someone talked about it in a panel discussion the other night, how they need to kind of top up their tank, you know, like to kind of keep refreshed and that they can kind of drain themselves and that that's one of the things that helps them is like either a change in scenery or a change of like, yeah, concept or a change of technique or like if you change something, then you, you have something new, you feel fresh, you play, you're curious and kind of you go off on a tangent again and then you can always kind of kind of loop back around yeah whilst everybody was doing their introductions I wrote down like any, any time that I felt there was like real talk like real focused talk about 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 being lost or lost in some way I wrote it down and I was like oh this will really help us to kind of bring the conversation you know and then like my it's like there's there's so much there's so much stuff you know loss of, loss of land loss of life loss through obsolescence being lost in your work loss of memory loss of data the duality of loss loss of freedom loss of buildings loss of play people being lost lost histories lost stories and i i could keep reading that's like half of the list you know so how do we begin to kind of draw things out, draw a narrative or a conversation out of all of our different artworks. Where do we where do we begin? I'm kind of opening it up to you guys as the panel. I mean, I don't I don't know if there's a specific, you know, narrative that ties everything together. I mean, as much as it might be the end goal of so much of this and of so much of this work and and the end goal of so much of the exploration of of being lost, right? Is that um, I think for the most part as artists, because we're choosing to like put these things out into the world at some point and let people into our like own insecurities, um, it's, you know, it's our attempt to no longer remain lost, right? It's our attempt to like share these little stories and share these moments and try to like connect to the world around us. Now, I know for me that one of the reasons, and you know, this is like, one of those aha education moments for me was like, I spent my entire undergrad and grad school making work about being, you know, a black male in America. And like, eventually it hit me one day that I was like, Oh, that's what I've been doing. I've been trying to like tell people how I feel and like why I feel alone. And like, and then my undergrad professor was like, yeah, of course that's what you've been doing for 12 years. How did you not see this? But I mean, it's that, you know, it's that sense of like wanting to, wanting to connect those threads you know and it's like my thread and your thread may be two different colors but once we make a knot out of them they're all of a sudden connected right and i mean so i think that's you know maybe a place where you know i see there being a sense of connection or um you know tie in i'm gonna stop my analogy now apparently so now i'm just making metaphor after metaphor so <laughs> there you go well i have one i usually stand by the whole the whole sense that you have to throw the map out, right? Because maps get you into trouble. Like if you stick to the map, you stick to the plan, 
there's so much that's going to get missed. And so throw the map out, get lost, get over it, and then you'll find exactly where you need to go. You don't need a map. So, yeah. And I, I, I just to chime in on that, uh, the, the whole idea why, why, you know, relate to a lot of various different types of art and all of that. And in a lot of ways, what I, what I see as a, as a, connecting tissue over here is that all of us no matter what medium we're working in um we are kind of creating we're kind of creating an action against something being lost we are do documenting uh either uh uh you know a, a feeling an expression a, a, an actual um uh, an actual uh, photons hitting that photographic material in a lot of ways um uh I was attracted to arts from a from a very early point because of the the notion of of sort of fixing something in time, something some kind of an artifact, some kind of an action. Uh, and I think, in a lot of ways, just as a um, just as somebody who don't like to really sort of. Uh, label myself as strictly a photographer because that kind of creates a sort of a notion of somebody who's photographing weddings but uh or or documenting something specifically um i like to think of myself as an artist who works with images um it's in a, in a lot of ways it's kind of uh the attractiveness to me was always uh also the physics behind that process, you know, whether you're using clay, whether you're using um, any kind of uh, pigment suspended in any kind of material, or you're using um, sort of chemical processes uh, or digital ones. Uh, it's a, it's an interesting way that you are sort of putting a, some kind of a stamp on the world or on time in order for something not to get lost and there's kind of an interesting um sort of uh, uh peaceful and and kind of reassuring feeling for me when it comes to that it's almost a kind of like a way to order your life or order your presence ever since i've been little i've been a collector of things uh you know little nature bits or weird machines that I could take apart or stuff like that. And I, I think a lot about the photographer Nan Golden saying that she photographed because she missed so many people so badly. And I think that the reason, at least for me, that I create things and that I, I make images is because I just, it's like a, it's an attempt to stem the tide of loss. I just feel like everything is lost not to be like the darkest little flower in the field but i just feel like so much of life is lost uh and finding ways to reassure yourself that you'll remember those things or to create importance uh and to kind of um amplify or, or lift up things that you don't want to forget or you don't want to lose i think that's what i i look to art to do for me is to to create these little memorials that i can keep with me i'll just say too is you know an interloper um that does a lot of this kind of interdisciplinary stuff now because i'm not an artist but i'm here and i do this in so many different ways now it's like i collaborate with people in all these different sort of locations and there's always the tendency uh, that comes back to kind of pulling it all together. And yet I, th the, I think the joy of the play of this that I just always want to come back to as an affective moment is this idea that um, uh, get lost, stay lost, which is like a Pixar quote and also like a Reaganomics album, right? I mean, it's, it's this notion of like sort of staying in that space of, of where things are in disarray. And of course, they, they have to be recovered momentarily, we're talking about to make but they're going back out into that place where it's like, cause I'm mean, listening to all of you as a, as somebody who's interested in making within a humanist context, I, I listening to you as artists, there's such a diversity of how you conceive this notion of what being an art is. And yet when you're outside looking in from these disciplinary pressures we get, right. It's like, it's made to seem so static and monolithic. Right.
in my experience anyway, that is so true. I was like, as an art student, I think as all art students, I was kind of quite um, idealistic and, you know, every everybody loves everybody and appreciates everybody's kind of diversity and, you know, everyone's scope. And then when I started lecturing, um, particularly when I was in like an art, college that then went through university status and when we became a university or seeing the faculties from the inside was like yeah I was it killed my little student dreams I can tell you that much <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure I, I quite like the I quite like the idea that um that's kind of being floated amongst the panel members that we're kind of you're happy to be you're happy to be lost and you're happy to kind of like like you just said Jen like stay stay lost at least you know for most of the time and then kind of have these little moments of you know maybe being less lost but then kind of going back to it um as kind of maybe the like the almost like the natural order or the natural state I don't know if that's a good description but he, yes, it's uh, kind of, we are getting lost to find something. It's kind of that. Because this is what I learned. When you're meditating, you have to get lost and leave everything and just just concentrate on your inner soul, inner breathing and everything. So you just get lost to find something. You get lost to find yourself. It's kind of... Art is kind of a meditating thing as well for me. It's it just, it just it's just so focusing when I paint, and I really even don't listen to my husband what he says. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, for me it's really it's really something different and really um, motivating, and it's 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 a different experience for me. Yeah. You know, I think it's also interesting too that like the the space of being of being lost to some extent, and this even goes back to kind of what Joshua was saying that it almost um, creates a, a space for evolution to incur. Right? It's like a space where that 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 thing transitions into something new and either spawns a new idea or, or spawns a like a rel of you know revelation or you know, but it's but it's the almost it's almost a sense of creating nothing out of or something out of nothing, right? To, to some degree, it's like that that empty space that you started with is now kind of overflowed, and that spillover is something completely different from what it started off as. So. And it's something I talk to with students, and I, I think about a lot in my own, you know, artist statements and stuff like that. Is in a related way, I, I always think about art as a question, and it's not that I'm ever looking for an answer specifically, it's that I'm, I'm meditating on and wrestling with and exploring this question. It's the kind of the same idea of being lost, that I'm not really trying to get somewhere, I'm just trying to, to explore as I go along. Uh, and, you know, I read, read as much about science as I do about art, probably more about science than I do about art, and I think the interesting thing and me, you know, I, I intended to be a microbiologist. The interesting thing then was that, at least in my really rudimentary understanding, I was always drawn to finding an answer. Like, what happens when I do this thing? And, and the result was important to me. And now as an artist, it's almost the opposite, where I'm really interested in this question. And what happens is just evidence that I have explored it, not necessarily the thing that I'm after. <laughs> I think also much like um, Josh was saying there, like at least I know that um, Easton and, uh, and myself also both started out in very different paths, kind of non-artistic paths that we kind of fell into. Uh, you know, so I think there's even a sense of, you know, the fact that, you know, there's that transition space that happens there. You know, it's not that, I'm assuming Josh, it's not that you lost all interest in science and biology. It's just that there was something that it wasn't fulfilling. You know, for me, I was pre-med and a medical illustrator and all of a sudden I realized that there was something that, that wasn't fulfilling for me and that, you know, I needed something to, to, to inform it, something more to kind of reach that next space that kind of felt like it made sense and felt like I could actually create dialogue and have conversations that connected and touched people and kind of made the world make sense to me, right? So I think even that sense of 
um, how we ended up in these places kind of extends to extends to this larger story and larger narrative that we're talking about. Hmm? Yeah, an arts researcher from the University of Leeds that I've worked with not extensively, but quite intensively, um, she would say that all artists, all makers, all creators are kind of lost in society because partly because of how we're viewed, but also because of how we kind of live in societal norms. We're kind of on the fringes somehow and that perhaps that feeds into this kind of narrative and that perhaps that's why this narrative of, of lost and loss and being lost or feeling it is kind of you know, woven through so much, through, through so much artwork. Yeah, I don't know what you guys think of that, but it seems to make sense to me. Well, I, yeah, I think you're, I thought Josh was going to say something, his, but <laughs> I'm put Josh up there. But no, I think that's space. what's that. I'm trying to leave space. I don't You're know. trying to leave space. Yeah. No, I mean that's an interesting point. Like thinking about how, like, because art, you know, whatever, what, whatever creative process that someone functions in, is, whether it's music, you know, art, fashion, interior design, graphics, you know, whatever. I mean, any kind of like uh, any kind of creative play that functions in that form sits on the fringe of things because a lot of people just don't understand how to do it, yeah. and then you know, people that function in those worlds, I think, are willing to gamble and take that risk just to see what happens. And that's how, uh, that's how innovation happens, uh, which is kind of interesting. It's like you take that leap, you jump in, you're, you know, you're not afraid, maybe you are afraid, but you just don't care. You're just like, let's see what happens. Um, but I think that has to happen. And that I think that is part of the idea of being lost. Like, you know, you, you have no idea what's on the other side. And so, but you can't find what's on the other side or get to the other side until you take that first step. So I had a professor in undergrad that I was struggling. I had taken, when Armand was talking about that, you know, where I went within my early student career, um, I had dropped, I was a music major, dropped out of that. I was an art major, dropped out of that, ended up in law, oddly enough. I got talked out of that and then I went back into art. <laughs> so my parents talked me back into art and I'd taken about a year off from it. And uh, they, uh, I was super struggling. I didn't know what to do. And I was literally told to go drive out into the middle of a cornfield and sit down. That's what I was told to do. And uh, By the devil? No, I, well, he might be, he might've been, I don't know. It's a, maybe it was a cotton field, but that would be more apropos, but uh, yeah. So I was told to do that. I was told, I was literally told to go get lost. And so, and I was told that when I was 19. And so I did it. I, I did. I went and drove out in the middle of a field, sat down. I was like, this sucks. <laughs> like there are bugs everywhere. <laughs> it's, but it's a really weird, strange place to like sit and explore and meander through. But, you know, I had to get in there to figure out how to get back out. So it's, uh, you know, that's the entire creative process, I think. That has to be the most backward story to arrive at a career in art that I've ever heard that you were like, I want to be a lawyer, knock it off, go sit in a cornfield and be an artist. Uh, <laughs> somebody said to you, so that's well, look, I mean, the story, the literal story is I got a call from my parents that said, we need to talk to you. And I thought someone was dying of cancer. And so they wouldn't tell me what they wanted to talk to me about. And I came home. They said, we think you need to go back into art. <laughs> Who says that? So, I mean, I think that in answer to your question, Sarah Jane, too, that part of the reason so many people, so much work relates to loss, I think, is that at least for me, and I think this might be more universal than just me, is that I think a lot of creators come from a background of loss of some kind, that they feel like they've, that they've lost something and that they, they want to create kind of as the, to have the opposite effect in the universe. They've lost identity, they've lost, you know, loved ones or whatever it is, they've lost something. 
uh, and they're trying to replace that by through creation. That's that's how it feels for me a lot of times. Anyway. response that I'm having to your response Joshua I feel a bit like I don't know <laughs> but maybe, yeah. I think that's true yeah yeah I, th I think yeah I think yeah I don't know like from a personal perspective like definitely for me that that is why I began creating and why I turned to art through loss of many forms. Is that why and I don't know that it's... Oh, no, it's okay. I was going to say, I don't even know that I, I think that it's conscious that that happens, but I think mm -hmm. that after thinking about, you know, I don't, I don't think... I've lost something. I will replace it with this bug. Uh, but uh, I think that one of the most... One of the hardest parts of being an artist isn't the play. That That's the the sheer joy the euphoria of creating something is is the whole part of it for me the hard work is coming back and reflecting on what i've made and and being able to try to you know synthesize it into my thinking about making art and what i do as an artist and my teaching and all that kind of stuff to me that's the hard work um but in that in that reflective phase or in thinking about it that's where i start to think more about how this relates to my life and my history and my interests and kind of that's that's a really interesting comment i think that for me as a practitioner it's the other way around the the reflecting on stuff i can i can do that i can do that for days that's why in fact i had such an intense relationship with this um, with this researcher, Doc, Dr. Annie Raw, she's called, and her, yeah, her work on um, interstitial spaces is just, it's like mind blowing. But I can sit and think and think and think and think and think. And then the playing bit, where I think it was Easton who said, like, oh, you know, you just jump in, you have no fear, or if you have fear, you kind of don't care. Like, God, I have fear and I do care, you know, like I massively feel that I massively feel that and then I kind of get I have this tendency to get in my head about stuff, you know, like um, Yeah, I have quite an anxious head, I think, you know, so that's why when I leave bodies of work I'm like, oh my god, I should be working on them. I should be doing stuff on them, you know, and then when I'm like, oh This is a color I've not mixed before. Ooh, should I like that? Do you know, it's like sometimes the kind of the the yeah the actual making of the artwork is the is the hardest part for me, and I never thought that was acceptable to say until I spoke to one of my painting heroes, Howard Hodgkin, and he said that painting was the hardest thing that he'd ever done in his life, and I was like, oh, good, okay, <laughs> yes, me too. <laughs> I really relate to that. Um, in so many ways, I think, and 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 being somebody who is comes from a, a different sort of disciplinary location. And my, I, I wasn't pre med or kind of, but I I was a combined physics, uh, humanities, English major. So I had a science background and and a background in the. And I think that that's why play. You you mentioned earlier, Sarah, that play gets diminished, right, and made to seem superfluous. But the reason it's so risky is it's exactly about that threshold, right? It's coming back from those spaces where you're trying to, you know, overcome the fear of saying, well, I have to control, I have to control the critical perspective on it, or I have to control the, the production of it. And it's in between those two things, you're leaping off to play in between that in those two spaces. And I think that that's what makes it very risky and very exciting and why it has to be diminished in culture, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Jen, that's, even, that's one of the things that I love about some of the work that you showed was that I think um, there's a real sense of experimentation there, and I think experimentation is born out of that desire for play, right? Yeah. And then, and that kind of space in between the two, and the fact that you're able to now like utilize that in a way that helps kind of convey that information and, and better drive the work itself. Yes. So. Yes.
I'm just leaving a little bit of space. <laughs> I just want to, I don't know, I, I don't want to be one of those hosts that likes the sound of their own voice too much. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean I, can, I, I can say that if anybody wants to, uh, wants to have a good time, get lost in like the back roads of Mississippi, Easton's the, Easton's the, the guy to do it with. So he's your... <laughs> Yeah, it'd be, it's always a good time. <laughs> so. so thank you for letting us do this. This is a lot of fun. Absolutely. Thank you all for joining in and taking part and yeah. contributing. Yeah, like honestly, every every time we put on an event and we um everything that we do, we do voluntarily and we know how much people <clears throat> have to give up to volunteer time and energy and work freely because we do it. So we appreciate you being here so much in all of your different time zones and head spaces and roles and for sharing and for discussing. I have loads of stuff in my head. I hope that you guys do too. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to, to close with anything or if we're all kind of A-OK. -okay. At least we're all lost together. <laughs> it's true. We're all lost. <laughs> um, yeah. could, could I ask if you could all send us um, some links to your works um, so that we can we can post it, well, so that we can have a look and, and dive deeper ourselves, uh, but also so that we can post them alongside the, the discussion. Of course. Yeah, that would be really helpful for people watching. Okay, yeah. well, thank you so much. Um, people who are artists in the festival anyway already know this, but for um, everybody else in the group, on Friday we're holding a digital dinner as part of the festival. I'm saying Friday, and now I'm going to have to check the calendar. It's the 24th. <laughs> Um, we have so many events going on that I don't know what's happening until the very day. Um, but you guys would be more than welcome to join us um, if, you're, if you're interested. I don't know if you've been to a digital dinner before. It's kind of, um, it's not my idea. I have pinched it from the kind of, um, yeah, the, the people who run an art collective that I'm a part of. And, um, yeah, we have digital dinners quite a lot, so you send out a recipe. The idea is that people all around the world make the recipe and come together at whatever time it is. It could be like 3 a.m. or whatever, but you try and make the meal. If you can't make the meal, you bring something from your own country, and then you all sit there like this, but with food, and just kind of have like a nice sharing time. So um, I will send out the, the information to you, and um, if you would like to join us, you're, you're more than welcome. And once again, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. It was good yeah. connecting with everyone. Yeah. Thank you for yep. this opportunity. Course, yes. Yeah, and I, I always enjoy uh, listening to everybody kind of ruminate <laughs> on the theme of loss. And we went through the process and through the through the whole meaning of art making. I think this was great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>